thank you, first of all, uh, Dietrich, for the invite. And welcome, everyone. My name is uh, Jos Gerardin. I'm one of the founders, also the CEO of Yields.io. And our company, Yields, is on a mission to embed trust in the world's most impactful algorithms. Okay, so there's plenty of mathematical models, algorithms that govern everything that is being done. And we really want to create tools to help users, builders of models, to actually make sure that those models function as expected. So now how does all of this relates to data, which is obviously the topic of today's meetup? Well, yeah, to, to start with, uh, with, um, with the saying that, that data is actually today's uh, new oil. It's the oil of the industry. Basically, it's what many industries is, um, are being, are consuming to generate value. So how does that work? How does data actually drive value? Well, actually, data is being used in many different ways. But first of all, like a, a primary use case of, of, of using data is basically just displaying the data to discover obvious patterns in the end. We want to gain insights, and these insights they are typically driven by discovering patterns in data. So when the data, when just visualizing the data would already lead to insights, well, for this type of of tools, you would you you would typically use BI tools to help to help with this. And um, I just wanted to show a very dreadful image. I apologize. <laughs> for it but um, like we have been bombarded by all kinds of graphs visualizing how COVID is spreading well this is kind of a simple way of looking at data is just visualizing it on the other hand what's much more interesting is that you might also want to discover new patterns in data and this, this, this pattern can be this can be quite deep of course and for this to do this, we are, we are using mathematical models or algorithms. And there's basically a couple of different types of algorithms to do that. Like the first one, what I show here, is actually an example from uh, DeepMind. So DeepMind is, an, is a machine learning, a very famous machine learning company. And they build a few algorithms that, for instance, beat the most complicated game and then the most co the world champion in go which is one of the most complicated games um and actually they evolved that algorithm a bit further to also train it again on chess but the algorithm became so powerful that it was able to actually discover new patterns in chess um even though that game already exists for so long so how does that relate to data well actually to learn from chess, what you need to do is, is play a huge amount of different games. And actually, by doing this, the, the games that you play become somehow data. No, and, and, and then you are using algorithms to basically learn from that data. And that's exactly what Alpha, Alpha Zero is doing. Now, somehow, this is still a kind of idealized type of application because the data that you generate in this way is somehow perfect as long as you encode the games of chess correctly then all the games that you play all the virtual games that you uh, generate to build up your data sets they're going to be correct somehow the data that you that you create has no mistakes however many other algorithms are used on data that is not correct, not that correct, that might might also contain issues. And in that case, other interesting things can happen, of course. A first uh, example is what can happen with incomplete data. So this is here, uh, some message that I took from from um, from Twitter. And some somebody said that he hooked a neural network up to his Roomba, so his automated uh, Hoover, a vacuum cleaner, and he wanted it to learn to navigate without bumping into things. And actually it learned to drive backwards um, because when driving backward, it doesn't have sensors to discover that it's bumping against something. So this is a very simple, straightforward um, and quite funny example, um, basically of uh, about incomplete data. And of course, if you're using data to learn patterns, but you are blind for some part of the, of the real world, then that actually is an issue. In the case of this Roomba, it's not that bad. 
However, if you think back at the um, at the the credit crisis in 2008, when almost the entire financial system was melting down, actually one of the underlying reasons of that credit crisis was the fact that people were using an overly simple model to estimate risk on complex mortgage derivatives. And so because they were using those simple models that they were kind of extrapolating only in a very crude fashion, they were blind for the actual risks that they were taking. So they, they, they didn't take into account enough data to be able to see the actual risks that they were taking. And this was causing this huge meltdown. A second example of issues that you can encounter with data when applying models is, um, is kind of nicely illustrated with this magnificent building here. This is called the Melbourne Monolith. It's the precursor of all these uh, mysterious monoliths that uh, were discovered in the end of last year. And obviously, as you can see here, this is not a real building. It's actually a building that is being rendered in Windows. So it's Windows um, flight simulator and in one of the recent versions where they started to use machine learning to basically create 3D maps from two-day plans. Um, and But these 3D maps sometimes contain some um, mistakes. For instance, here the height of that particular building in Melbourne was incorrectly input and as a consequence when you were flying over Melbourne you could see this uh, massive building. Again, this is a quite funny example about uh, the impact of uh, data quality issues on the performance of a mathematical model. However, there's plenty of other less funny examples like um, uh, all, all kinds of gender bias that is being discovered in, in machine learning algorithms, for instance, or very recently it was discovered that um, measuring the oxygen concentration in blood does not work as well for black skinned people as opposed to white skinned people. And, and actually the, the underlying reason is that the sensors generate more uh, noise on the data and that noise has an impact on the actual uh, interpolation of the data to compute the oxygen content. So again, issues <clears throat> with data and this time here, uh, like noise on the data itself. And then there's obviously like an almost infinite list of issues with algorithms that are caused by data. Um, I just wanted to, um, I just wanted to share here a spreadsheet that has been compiled by a researcher from DeepMind as well. Um, this is also a quite uh, interesting use case here. Um, so, so what, what that researcher lists in this in this file is basically for known mathematical uh, journal papers. What was actually well, that the, the conclusions inferred from those papers were wrong because they were not using the machine learning algorithms correctly. Um, and in this case here, um, actually what happened is that some researchers were training an, um, a neural net again to classify mushrooms into edible and poisonous ones. And what they did to feed the neural network with data was to alternatively feed it an edible and then a poisonous mushroom, then again an edible one, then a poisonous one, and so on. And so actually they were quite um, surprised to find that their algorithm was reaching almost maximum accuracy. But then actually what happened is that the neural network learned that the data was alternating and it didn't learn any feature from the mushrooms itself. So in that case, actually the data is fine. The data doesn't, the data set didn't contain a mis any mistakes or noise or wasn't incomplete, but it was rather the way in which the data was used to build the model that caused the actual issue. So this just to show you how how closely linked are data sets and data quality versus building models to to do something meaningful with with that data. And actually it's important to kind of realize that there is quite a bit of risk related to using models um, on data sets basically and models in the first place. So now this type of model risk, so basically managing the risk that the models that you are using do not generate expected results. That model risk is something that has been quite actively managed in the financial sector for already quite some time. And the main reasons are that first of all, the financial sector has been producing massive amounts of data, obviously. There've also been 
um, historically very intensive users of mathematical models. Back in the 90s, it was more statistical type of models. Nowadays, it's quite a huge amount of uh, machine learning algorithms, of course, as well. Um, and on top of that, plenty of uh, accidents have happened. It has, um, there's been many numerous examples where, where banks uh, lost billions of dollars because of mistakes in models. And because of this, regulatory requirements are quite strict in the financial sector. So one of the famous, one of the most famous um, regulatory bodies uh, on model risk management is actually published by the Fed in, in the state, the Federal Reserve. Um, and, and they start by, first of all, defining a model. And so what is important here in the official definition of a model is that it's a, it's a very broad definition. So it's any method that has some assumptions to create some kind of a quantitative estimate as considered a model. And every model that is being used need to be managed uh, properly. Now, model risk then is also defined quite uh, broadly in, in this original regulation from the Fed. And it says that model risk is actually the potential for adverse consequences based on incorrect or misused model outputs, okay? So this basically means that there is and on average, two types of issues that can appear with models. Either the simple ones are like bugs in software. It's you just made a mistake. You may, maybe you made a calculation mistake or you were applying somehow mathematical theory incorrectly, which obviously leads to mistakes in the outputs of a model. However, the more subtle and much more often encountered issue is the fact that you can, you might apply a model in a, in a context for which it has not been um, developed. To give you a very simple example, suppose I want to build a model to predict the temperature for tomorrow, okay? And then to be able to build such a model, I will need massive amounts of data, like the historical temperature here uh, here in Belgium, but maybe also some additional like a wine data or or other climate data. And suppose now that I would, first of all, like train my model on say 18th century meteorological data, and then I would apply it today um, and on, on today's climate. Since climate has changed, probably my model is not going to work as expected. And that is exactly what is meant here with model risk uh, as it would be um, materialized to say incorrect or inappropriate use of models. It's you, you, when you, when you're using a model, you need to understand on what data it has been trained and for what context it has been developed. Now, that type of model risk um, is typically managed through what we call a model risk management framework. And such a framework has basically four main components. The first one is a proper definition of a model. So you, you, uh, if, if you are an organization and you're using mathematical infrastructure and you want to start managing model models, model risk, then the first question to ask obviously is what defines a model? And so in classical models, um, statistical models, for instance, it's quite clear what a model is. However, with machine learning, somehow the data itself becomes part of a model and um, this needs to be taken into account when you define a model. For instance, if I have say a, a particular neural network that I train on a data set, if I now take the same neural network, but I train it on a different data set, does that constitute a different model? Yes or no? If so, then you will have to manage it differently. So, so th these, are, these are considerations to take into account when defining models. Secondly, what you need to pay, put in place as well is a, a certain level of governance. So what does that mean? Well, first of all, you need to define what are the roles and responsibilities for everyone who's building models. So you might have people who are primarily like data scientists, creating models, like manage, uh, trying to figure out patterns and data. Then you might have also people who, who's, who, whose task is to control, to verify that those models have been um, developed properly. And so actually what's happening most often, especially in the financial sector, is that um, people put in place what is called the three lines of defense. So this means that you have three different independent teams who all have a certain responsibility in making sure that models 
are propagating according to the specifications for which they have been uh, developed. So the first line of defense in that case is the model developers and their primary, primary task is to first of all, make sure that the model is being developed according to the state of the art, but also that they document clearly uh, what's the purpose and under what constraints the model works as it should. And again, many of those constraints are actually driven by the underlying data that is being used to build those models in the first place. Then the second line of defense, the second line of defense is what is called validation. And this is an independent team whose task it is to study the model documentation and, and the data sets and verify independently that the model developer has actually created something that fits the requirements and that functions correctly. And then the third line of defense is what we call audits, but it's sometimes also the regulator is part of this third line of defense. And the main task for the third line is to verify that the communication and the roles and responsibilities between first and second line are implemented correctly and that there is no residual risk. Then the two other pillars, pillars um, for model risk management are actually a bit more quantitative. So first of all, you have the model validation. So model validation, as I said, is verifying independently reviewing models. And to perform model validation, you need to have certain um, procedures put in place, like how are you going to verify that the model is working as it should? Well, the first and foremost um, task that needs to be uh, reviewed is to check the data. So what, what, when you are validating a model, almost up to 80% of the time is going to be spent on verifying that the data makes sense. And this means that you check that the model developers have um, put enough effort in cleaning the data. So verifying that the data actually does not contain the anomalies that I showed in the beginning, but it's also making sure that the data is representative. And again, here I go back to my previous example. If I want to forecast the temperature and I train my model on the 18th century data set, well, that 18th century data set is probably not representative anymore from for today's climate. Therefore, the conclusions that I would infer from the model are not going to be correct. And then apart from that, obviously, you also want to verify that the model is performing as it should. This is often called backtesting. And sometimes you even build alternative models to verify the performance. And this is called benchmarking. And then finally, the, the fourth important pillar is what we call monitoring. And this is really when you have put your model into production that you actually need to continuously verify that the model is performing as it should so you can do something about it. You don't want to discover after three months that your, uh, your, your investment algorithm, for instance, has not been functioning over the last three weeks. So because of this, you need to monitor continuously models. And here again, an important aspect of monitoring is uh, monitoring the data as it flows through the model. So you want to ver continuously verify that the data is complete, that the data does not contain any outliers or that outliers are being detected uh, efficiently. And you want to continuously verify as well that the data on which you are operating the models is sufficiently close to the data on which you have trained, trained the models in the first place. Now, what we notice as well is that that type of model risk management actually has evolved drastically um, over the last 10 years. And, and there's basically two important aspects to it. First of all, um, model risk management has, uh, like 10 years ago, it was primarily a concern for the financial sector. Today, with the advent of machine learning, with these, the, 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 this, this, all these big projects on, on, on opening data sets and opening data sets for other industries, we see that basically every industry nowadays is building complex mathematical models and therefore needs to have a certain amount of model risk management in place if they want to successfully operate these analytics. And secondly, an, uh, an important, another important aspect is the fact that model risk management has evolved from a purely governance qualitative type of activity into something that is really very quantitative. You need to measure, you need to measure model performance, you need to measure the risk involved in, in, in models. 
Uh, and you need to do this with technology so you can automate it and do it at scale. Um, and, and the reason for this is that the, the, the signature or the, the, the character of models has evolved a lot. Um, like 10 years ago, models were primarily used uh, like were, were like bottom-up approaches. Like you start with a statistical assumption and then you build out a model based on those assumptions. Nowadays, you learn from data and you extract non-linear patterns from it with neural networks, with other types of, of algorithms. And because of this, all kinds of interesting effects uh, can, can appear. I already mentioned bias, uh, which is obviously an important one. This is also an interesting example. This is called an adver ad adversarial attack. So basically, if you, for instance, train a classifier, if you, if, what I mean is, suppose you built an image, re an image recognition um, algorithm that would be trained to to classify pictures of pandas and gibbons okay so i mean it might not be the most the best uh, business case ever but i'm sure that you can dream of other classifiers that could be more interesting now what has been proven is that if you make the if you use these complicated algorithms uh, like neural networks or gradient boosting algorithms or other types of non-linear behavior then actually you can always find examples of data that has been tuned a little bit to maximally confuse the algorithm. Okay, so in this case, this is a real picture of a panda and the classifier is able to decide with almost 60% confidence that this is indeed a panda. Then some synthetic noise has been added on top of that picture. Um, and actually, as a human, you can hardly see any difference between those two pictures. However, for the algorithm, this is with 99% certainty a given. Okay, and this has been shown to exist in basically every type of model, and not only for classifiers, for instance, in speech recognition, there has been already a synthesized uh, voice that, uh, like as a human, you hear a particular message, but if you use a, a machine learning algorithm to interpret the, the sound, the message that is decoded is something completely different. Okay, so, so this actually also has impact on security, for instance, but it's again driven by the data um, so we, what we do is we synthetically create a small deviation of an existing data set to confuse the algorithm. And this is called sometimes also data engineering or data poisoning. Good. So what are other challenges then specifically for the financial industry is that the number of uh, regulatory frameworks that impact model risk management are uh, all the time increasing and uh, with higher and higher frequency. Also, the demands are much stricter. But on top of that, the number of models that are being used in a financial institution increase with around 20% every year. Now, this regulation, as you will see, is now also popping, popping up in other industries. So actually, that type of, of considerations are quite important, not only for finance. Now, what are, what are the current issues with uh, managing model risk? Well, for many, many, many financial institutions, especially as they are transitioning from this qualitative to a more quantitative risk management methodology, they notice that actually the requirements for technology are very different. Um, so for instance, what is key if you want to be able to, to measure your model performance is to actually be able to guarantee reproducibility okay so what that means is suppose that at a certain amount of, uh, at a certain point in time you discover bias in a model and because of this you need to re retrain your model to build uh, and to, to be able to continue well if then after one year for instance the auditor comes about and asks you why did you retrain the model then you actually need to be able to put the cursor of time back at the moment when you discovered bias and be able to reproduce exactly the same conclusion this is quite hard for many for many organizations because data continuously uh, changes over time and also the analytics change over time so this is a key issue in, in managing today's model risk another one is to be able to keep track with between all the links that exist because models typically do not operate in isolation they need data but they also sometimes feed into other models they are used to generate documents and you need to keep track of all those links and so in the end 
what is basically needed as another type of data science platform uh, to be able to guarantee all those reproducibility and links bet between objects. And that's exactly what we have built at Yields.io. We have built a data science platform specifically designed to manage model risk management. And that data platform calls, is called Kyren. Um, and I, I just wanted to mention a few slides on, on this um, today. So the first thing, um, the, the first thing that I would like to also explain is, is basically when you are building mathematical models, there is a certain life cycle. Um, li like with software, for instance, if you're building software, there is a, there is a life cycle from say an ID into a prototype into something that like an MVP, a real production uh, pr production software, and then maybe you want to at a certain point in time also retire the software to because you have built something better. The same is true when you are building models. So you first will to do some kind of a creative um, development phase where you need a huge amount of freedom to try out many different approaches. Once a certain approach has crystallized, you actually want to test that that approach works and you need to document it to be able to later also manage or prove to say the validation team that uh, you knew what you were doing. So, um, this is the second stage in a model lifecycle process. After that, you need to ask validation teams basically to, to, to review what you did. Then the model is, produ is productionized, so deployed in production. And then once it's in production, it needs to be monitored. And then actually, um, and, and then actually after, after it runs in production, maybe you want to build a new version or you have modified it a little bit and then the entire cycle starts again. So it's, it's a kind of cyc uh, cyclical process. However, it's non-sequential. There's plenty of iterations as you can also see here, because at a certain point in time, you might discover an issue which basically moves you back, um, back, back to square one, back to the develop, back, back to the whiteboard, basically to develop a new approach. So being able to deal with that requires technology and that's exactly what we do. So and as a model developer, if you need to test your models at scale and produce automatic model documentation, then you can do this with Kyren. We guarantee reproducibility of every analysis that you, ha that you have done. Once you have your model ready, you need to share it with the second line, sharing in an efficient fashion, not only the reports, but also the data sets and the underlying analytics. All of this is also facilitated with, with Kyren. And then finally, monitoring the model, uh, the model in, in production and automating all those tests and detecting issues with data quality, with model performance, all of this can also be automated within the data science platform that we have built. Now, there is also a couple of, of stages in this life cycle that are typically not uh, run into Kyren. Um, and the first one is this initial exploratory phase when, when, when you're building a model. Well, then, as I said, you need a lot of freedom as a model developer because you want to be able to test, say, the bleeding edge, uh, the newest libraries. You want to try out different data sets. So you need an open system. Kyren by design is a bit more constrained because we need to guarantee reproducibility. So that's why the initial development typically happens outside of Kyren. And secondly, when deploying models into production, this is also typically done with other model serving infrastructure um, and there's plenty of, of, of frameworks that can deal with that. So the what what we have built is so the infrastructure but on top of that we have also built analytics and but the analytics in the platform are analytics designed to detect issues with other algorithms or issues with data sets so it's not the typical type of like a model development type of analytics it's an alternative type of 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 technology and analytics that has had to be developed to do exactly this type of work Good. So let, let's now go come, take one step back. Um, so we have been talking about uh, model uh, risk management regulation, and I gave you the example of SR 11.7 from the US, from the Federal Reserve. This is kind of old regulation already. It's all, it's been around around it's been around for ten years now. Um, however, there's plenty of new um, initiatives currently, and actually, the the European Union plays an important role in um, in uh, in driving 
different the industry towards model risk, better model risk management for AI models. Okay, and actually, over the over the last few years, the European Commission has made a few publications on building trustworthy AI, and this is not only for uh, important for the financial sector, but it's also for healthcare, for for any AI application actually. And one of the recent, most recent publications was the so-called assessment list for trustworthy AI. This is not yet regulation, it's more like a guidance um, for model developers, for companies who are building and deploying machine learning and AI applications to give them a set of seven principles to help assess the risk and, and make sure that the models function as they should. So this is like a modern, a modern version of a model risk management regulation. And what is interesting, first of all, is that the seven main principles, and, and you can see them here, are an, a mix of qualitative and quantitative assessments. And that actually makes sense. So if you are deploying, say, if you are building a self-driving car um, and you're creating models for the self-driving car, then you will have to also build in controls to kind of hand over back to the human driver if the car, if the algorithm comes in a situation where it's unable to make a decision. So this is an example of a qualitative assessment that needs to be done. And when reviewing your self-driving car algorithm, you need to, 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 to verify indeed that the model, that there is certain controls in place to help with that handover process. On the other hand, there's also plenty of quantitative assessments that 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 need that can be or that have to be implemented, and some of them are again related to, for instance, bias and fair fairness and non-discrimination. What I highlighted here are the ones that are primarily focusing on, say, data and data quality and and and, and data management topics. And then let me just dive with the, in two slides in a slightly more technical way into what these actually mean. So the first one on technical robustness and safety, there's plenty of aspects to it. And of course, some of them are, are just about say, making sure that your the model that you have built is sufficiently as, as, as sufficiently robust so so that it can operate in a rich set of, of, of uh, situations. However, part of that robustness assessment is also verifying that your model is able to deal with, say, issues in the data set. So if you have, for instance, missing data, or if there is anomalies in the data set, that you have made sure that actually the model the, the, the model is able to continue to operate more or less uh, at, at, at a relatively high accuracy. So for instance, to show you how you can actually assess this in Kyren, well, in Kyren we have already analytics in place to measure the quality of your data set, to also segment the data into say, typical data and not typical data, and then to measure how the model would perform over the typical and the atypical data to understand what would be the typical drop in performance of the model. So this is like data poisoning, which is an important aspect of, uh, of the Altai uh, list. On the other hand, you can, also, you can also have security concerns, right? Going back to my uh, self-driving car algorithm, if someone would want to launch a um, adversarial attack on the algorithm, it could build, uh, he or she could, for instance, create some stickers, QR codes, for instance, to put on uh, the, on, on some traffic signs to maximally confuse the, 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 the machine learning model. So when you are verifying or validating AI algorithms, you also need to assess how robust the algorithm is going to be against those type of adversarial attacks. Okay, and, and again, in Kyren, you have all the analytics in place to do that type of testing in a highly automated fashion and to actually benchmark the robustness of your algorithm against other approaches. Another important data related topic, of course, is everything related to privacy. Um, with privacy, there is uh, m many concepts, of course, that are imp Im important. I think for, for the machine learning and AI community, one of the most important uh, concepts that have been discovered uh, over the last few years is this concept of differential privacy, which allows you to train models on data 
without uh, jeopardizing the privacy of the, the data owners. However, when you are measuring, um, say, or if, if, you, if you want, and you don't have a um, differential privacy in place, you can actually also measure other metrics on the data to verify how large the risk is of disclosure, for instance. So disclosure risk means that if you have a data set that is being used uh, for, for building a model, for instance, and that data set is somehow anonymous, then of course, normally you would expect that you cannot discover who a certain, like uh, you, that you would expect that you are unable to identify a single person from that data. Now, however, Suppose now that in that data set, there are different features like, uh, I don't know, um, education, maybe uh, health, histor health history, um, your profession. Suppose that actually by combining some of those features, you are able to ident identify uniquely a given sample. You might still not know who that sample corresponds to, but if you would be able to like merge that data set with another maybe publicly available data set, you might actually be able to discover who that particular sample refers to. So this is what we call disclosure risk, and you can measure it and quantify it by basically counting how many samples you can identify uniquely. So this just to say that privacy, even if your data is anonymized, um, as long as you are able to like group features together to identify a single sample, there is still a risk for privacy. And the last point that is data driven in this assessment list of trustworthy AI is the point on bias and fairness. And what I wanted to highlight here is um, again, like how fairness needs to be defined and how it actually is uh, emerging from the data set itself. So let's take a simple example. Um, I mean, let's assume, let's assume that, uh, that, that we are in a country that has two different uh, languages. Um, the North speaks Dutch and the South speaks French. Now suppose that you are building say a credit scoring model. So this is a model that is going to decide if someone can is allowed to take a loan, yes or no. Okay, so for instance, if you want to build a house and you need a mortgage, then a credit score model is going to be used. Now, normally here in Belgium, you would not expect that the language, your mother tongue, should have an impact on the outcome of the credit risk assessment. So in that case, if you do not expect this language to be actually used, then you would call this a protected attribute. Okay, so you expect that the model is not going to take that into account. No, the question is how do you want to actually realize this when you are building a model? The first thing that you could do is basically simply remove language from the data set altogether. So this is what we call creating unawareness. And this might seem to be a good idea. However, in the context of Belgium, for instance, it's not really the smartest thing to do. Why not? Well, because somehow you, the language, the mother tongue, is highly correlated with the uh, the address of the person uh, of the person's home, obviously, because if you are in the north, then most likely you will speak Dutch. If you're from the south, then probably you will be French speaking. This is called redundant encodings. It's actually is an um, an aspect where the model would actually automatically discover that it can kind of reverse engineer the protected attribute. So basically, creating an awareness, an awareness is only useful if you have only very highly uncorrelated or totally uncorrelated attributes that are being used in a model and the model itself is primarily a linear a simple model so in, in most of the cases this doesn't work another thing that you can do is enforcing what is called demographic parity so demographic parity means that you want to have exactly the same outcome um, for dutch and french speaking uh, population. So this could be in certain contexts the best possibility. However, it might not be always considered the most fair from the community point of view. So as one example, let's assume that say the north, the northern part, the Dutch speaking part of the population would on average be more risk taking than the south, uh, the southern part, then in that case actually, 
if you enforce demographic parity, it means that the same amount of Dutch and French speaking people will get a loan. However, the Dutch speakers will on average default more often. They will more often take a loan that they cannot pay back. So in that case, what will happen is that the South is going to pay for the North. So in that case, under some constraints, this is not considered uh, fair. And on that case, in, in those cases, what people often introduce is something called equalized odds. So with equalized odds, what you're trying to achieve is that the mistakes that the model make are independent of the protected uh, attribute. What, what I mean by this is if, if my credit scoring model is going to try to estimate the likelihood that the person is not going to be able to pay back the loan, then the amount of errors that I make on the so southern and northern part of the country, on the French and the Dutch speaking, should be relatively similar. So in that case, we call this equalized odds. And under some constraints, this is uh, the, the most fair outcome. Now, a last point that I want to highlight here is actually another interesting uh, aspect, uh, meaning about wh who is actually using the data. So it's very often the case that protected attributes cannot be used by model developers. Okay, so if you are building and uh, I don't know, like an HR screening algorithm, and you have you have CVs, then it's very likely that the data that you're going to receive to build your uh, CV screening algorithm will not contain gender or nationality of the applicants. However, to be able to measure if the model that you have created con has bias, yes or no, to be able to measure that you actually need those attributes. So it's it's possible that you actually need to build two data sets, one data set that can be used for model development that does not contain the protected attributes and because you are not allowed to use them. And then another set of da data where basically you have all those protected attributes so you can actually measure if the model is bi biased, yes or no. Good. Um, <clears throat> So how or where is this type of uh, analysis used? Well, uh, today um, the, the, the main clients that, that we have are financial institutions, as I, as I said before. And uh, as I already explained, the, there is these three lines of defense and we have clients in each of those, those lines. Some of them are small regional banks. Um, others are like the top, in, in the top five or top 10 of largest banks in the world. Now, what I would like also to, to note, note here is that we already have a few clients also outside of the financial sector, uh, as we are uh, speaking here in, in, in Ghent, actually the VDAB, um, the VDAB the, is using Kyren as well. So um, this government agency helps um, helps to support job seekers finding their jobs faster. Um, and for instance, they're using plenty of data analytics and, and data science to improve their offering. For instance, they build models to predict the risk of being unemployed for a long time. And based on that risk assessment, the support that you will get is going to be different. Of course, to be able to offer those services, they also need to have proper governance in place to make sure that there is no bias, no fairness issues. And they also sometimes have to answer questions, parliamentary questions on these topics. And they're using Kyron to be able to guarantee that models are fair and that everything has been properly documented and tested. Good. I will conclude today with just a, a very brief overview of the company as well. So we are still relatively young, uh, four years four years in. We are VC-backed uh, primarily by Volta and Pamica, which are two Belgian uh, VCs. Um, and currently we are a team of 20 people, primarily in Brussels, but we also have an office in London. Um, I'm also very proud to have very senior advisors um, who help us build this product. Uh, Peter Nolan used to be former global head of model risk at the Royal Bank of Scotland. And Bob Mark has uh, created an, uh, or is, is the founder of the financial mathematics course um, in a big Californian university. Good, that's it. Um, I 
if you have any questions, please uh, don't don't hesitate. I hope I I made clear somehow that there is a, a very close link between data sets and then models. And if you want to build models in a sustainable fashion, if you want to make sure that models continue to function correctly, then you need to manage those risks. And a bulk, a big part of the risks related to operating models are actually driven by data. So this concludes today's talk on um, model risk and its links to, um, to, to, to data and data ops. If there is any questions, then uh, don't hold back. Otherwise, I wish you a very nice evening. <laughs>